you, if you had risotto, you haven't had this risotto. And the testing, testing. Farm the table. He's with uh, he's the chef and world time store. You get a chance to stop by and see it. After this, you're going to be sold on it. So we'll give it up for Chef Marcus and have a have a good time. Awesome. What's up, everybody? What is the, um, what's the next time? What's the next time, an hour from now? Uh, hour from now? Yeah, you got it. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that means hurry up, she wants to get out. <laughs> All right, what's happening, everybody? Welcome to the 20th, is it the 20th annual Hudson Valley Wine and Food Festival? Who was here when it was at Greg Farm? 21st. Who was here when it was at Greg? Yeah, of course you were. <laughs> Who was here when it was at the Greg Farm? Anybody? Oh, those were the days, right? Way back when, 2004, 2005. When did we switch to here? 16 years ago, we've been here, so yeah. Once upon a time, we were at a farm. It was still a great time. Had a great time going. Uh, this is one of my favorite events of the year because it's in my home territory. I speak all over the country, um, and the Hudson Valley is a special place because I live here. I do business here. I've been here since I was nine years old, moved away after high school, uh, came back 10 years later to open a restaurant, and this is the Hudson Valley's home to me. And no matter where I go, whether it's Italy, California, Mexico, all these beautiful wine regions, you know, it's Hudson Valley, it's home for me. So this is it's super, super exciting for me to be here. Um, so, and this is like, I wouldn't miss this for anything. So, unless it was a $50,000 wedding catering job that weekend. No, just kidding, just kidding. Okay, so, <laughs> there is conflicts, there are conflicts sometimes, so. I could be here for one out of the two days. No, I went, so a huge thank you to uh, Michael over there for being the pioneer of this event. So thank you, Michael, for putting this on and really gathering everybody together to showcase what's happening here in Nutson Valley. So my name is Marcus Giuliano. I own a restaurant in Ellenville, a Roman time bistro for the last 18 years. That's my wife, business partner, um, high school sweetheart, all that kind of stuff. So, <laughs> and my photographer for right now. So, you had a good shot? Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right, so, every year I do this event, or most years I do this event, I have a booth right over there. I'm giving away a wine trip to Italy, so make sure you scan it, fill it out, go to the booth. So. We're an extremely farm-to-table restaurant, but we're be besides farm-to-table, we're bar-to-table as well, right? So we're like, the whole bar is like very independent, small distilleries, small producers. Like for example, like we don't serve Tito's Vodka, because Tito's Vodka isn't a distillery. They're a bottler. They buy product from MGP, Midwestern Grain Products in Kansas. They buy neutral grain spirit, they bring it into the facility, they run it through a still and call it handcrafted vodka. If you go to Tito's today, there's no grain, there's no mills, there's no mash because they're buying something else. It's like buying Heinz ketchup and adding a couple things to it and calling it craft ketchup, handcrafted ketchup, boutique ketchup. It's a scam and we don't buy into any of those scams at the restaurant. Although I gotta tell you, those scams are very lucrative because that's how most restaurants make money. They buy the big brands, they get deep discounts, and they serve stuff that sort of like cuts corners, cuts people out of the equation like jobs and communities, and I'm very, very against that. So for example, like Rolling Rock. Rolling Rock was one of the iconic American breweries. Budweiser bought them, shut the plant down, laid everybody off, and took all the production to Jersey City. So how like cool is it buying Rolling Rock now knowing that you killed a community? Johnny Walker's the same thing, 700 jobs laid off 
in that small town because a big company bought it. Diageo bought it, and Diageo controls the market with a lot of spirits. I don't want to give my hard-earned money to Diageo, to Anheuser-Busch, to William Grant. I don't want to give my money or your money to any of those producers because they're not for us. They're for globalization. They're for cutting down on stuff and making money and cutting all of us out of the equation and cutting down jobs. All right, so with that being said, I'm gonna cook risotto today. I'm gonna talk about balsamic vinegar. The balsamic vinegar is one of the most beloved um, ingredients of Italian. Uh, it's, it's prosciutto, it's buffalo mozzarella, it's balsamic, right? So balsamic vinegar is like, ooh, ah, like I have like a $100 bottle of balsamic vinegar at home. I have a 12 year age balsamic vinegar, a five year age balsamic vinegar, ooh, ooh, ah. I'm going to tell you about all the difference in balsamics and why one costs 15 bucks and one costs 300 bucks side by side. I'm going to tell you about that today and how that does. But we're going to make risotto today. So because everyone loves risotto. Who do, does anybody not love risotto? Everybody loves risotto? Okay, good. Perfect. So I'm going to take questions because I love taking questions and answering for people about real food and about how things should be in food. So, is this camera on? It will, it will be. Perfect. All right, so, balsamic risotto. Risotto is one of my all time favorite dishes to make because you can just make so many different types of risotto. Like right, mushroom risotto, lop, lobster risotto, scallop and corn risotto, um, you name it. Like risotto is like one of those things that's so versatile. And of course, risotto is Italian rice. It's a rice, but it's sort of like a rice porridge. And usually, when you make risotto, usually when you make rice wherever you are in the world, you put rice hot water in a pot, you put a lid on it, and you don't touch it, right? You don't stir right, you don't touch it. It's one of those things where you come back 50 minutes later, you're like, ooh, ah, the rice is ready, let's eat. Risotto's the opposite. If you don't touch it, it's not good. You have to touch it, you have to stir it, you have to, you have to be involved with it, right? So, to start off risotto, you need onion, garlic, shallot, any of the above. You know, if you're, it, it's really one of those things like, like what do I want to put in it? Do I want to put onion? Do I want to put garlic? Do I want to put shallot? Do I want to put all three? You know, do I want to add some herbs to it? Do I want to add some, some thyme to it, which I have some fresh thyme today? Okay, good. So we got over there. So I'm going to need a volunteer today. Anybody want to volunteer? You should come up on stage. Anybody want to come up on stage today? Come on up. Come on up. So, what is your name? George. Welcome, George. Everybody give a big ha hand for George. George's arm is going to fall off for the next 45 minutes, okay? Just so you know. You're going to be, George's going to be stirring away. His arm is going to fall off. Your righty or your lefty? Okay. Do we have a wine glass for him after this is done? Okay, good. All right. George, you're going to stir, and I'm going to talk. All right? I'm going to show you what to do while I talk, okay? So, risotto is one of those things that, you know, if you don't like butter, you're in trouble. I've made risotto without butter before, and it's good. I've used sweet potato puree instead of butter, and it works okay. One of my most favorite dishes as a young chef was risotto. And I would, let's see, okay, good. So I got some butter in there. I got some chopped onions. And we're just gonna start like sweating, sweating these off a little bit. Nothing beats a wooden spoon. Right, a wooden spoon. And how cheap are they now, right? You go to the store and you buy a $2 wooden spoon and they're made of pine 
and you come in home and they're so flimsy. A good wooden spoon is a good investment. Yeah, you would know if your mom beat you with this, right? Who here? Well, let's not get that. Let's not talk about that. So, all right, George, you're just going to stir this. We're going to start sizzling here. Actually, you know, we're going to switch burners because this burner seems a bit hotter. We need some firepower. All right, so who, who's enjoying the wine today? Who's been like, oh, wow. Like, who, who's first time here? First time? Awesome. Welcome. Thank you. So this is an amazing event. Like I said, it's been going on for 21 years. I've been to this many, many years, probably 10, 12 years I've been to this. I haven't like cooked every year, nor have I had a booth every year. Sometimes I've come here as a consumer and be like, I'm having a great time today. This is awesome. But as a restaurant owner, I'm always working. So I like to walk through the rooms here. And I like to talk to the owners. I like to see what's going on. I like to see my friends. 18 years in business, I have a lot of friends in these rooms, right? So we walk, we hug each other, we say, hi, how you doing? Glad you're here, good to see you. You know, try this, this is new, this is awesome. And so it's really awesome to really be here and be in that kind of role where a lot of my friends are, have booths here. So that's great. Sorry, right, so we're gonna just let that, let that little sizzle a little way, Peter. Don't, don't stir yet, don't, don't kill your arm yet. You have ice for your arm afterwards? Ice pack like a pitcher? Okay. That, that's literally what risotto's like. It's like after you're done, you're like, let me ice my arm down, right? Am I, am, I, am I up tomorrow to make risotto? So, all right. So, we're going to make balsamic risotto today. We're going to make balsamic risotto. Balsamic risotto is traditional in Emilia Romagna. Who's been to Italy? Who wants to go to Italy? Who's been to Italy and wants to go to Italy? Who doesn't care about Italy? Raise your hands. Okay, good. All right, good. We're all in the right place. All right, so sign up because you could win a trip to Italy today, right? So we're giving away eight days in Italy. Because I know a lot of the vineyard owners and I have a, I, we're very farm to table, when we go to Italy, I bring it to the people I know, the people I trust, the people I'm friends with. Same thing in California. Same thing in the Finger Lakes. Like we go see Peter Weiss, right? Who's been to Weiss Vineyards over here, right? Peter's amazing, right? He's got it going on, really good stuff. There's a reason why his booth is jam packed today. Because the guy's making phenomenal wine and he's growing by leaps and bounds. It's great. So go check out Peter Weiss today. Go check out Zugaby. The guys at Zugaby are killing it too. I love Zugaby. Uh, Fulkerson. Great story of Fulkerson. Three weeks ago, I was at Fulkerson Vineyard. I stayed in their Airbnb, which is on their vineyard. So if you're going to the Finger Lakes, you need a little property to stay at, check out Fulkerson. They have an Airbnb right on. You wake up, you walk 50 yards, you're in the vines. So check out Fulkerson. It's a four-bedroom property, farmhouse right, right, right on their property. All right, so looks like we're sizzling a little bit up there, huh? All right, let me get back up there. Lower the heat, okay. All right, so first lesson with risotto. There's three types of rice. There's the rice that's good and rare that nobody gets. There's the rice that's very popular that the Italians want us to use because they know it's not good. Then there's the third rice that the Italians use. There's enough of it to go around, but there's not much of it that's really coming to America or American chefs don't know much about it. And that rice is called carnaroli. Carnaroli, C-A-R-N-O-L-I, Carnaroli. When you go to a store and you buy risotto rice, you're typically buying Arborio. Is anything wrong with Arborio? You can, is anything wrong with Arborio? No, nothing's wrong with Arborio. However, it's not what the Italians use. It's what the Italians ship us to use. They say, well, you guys use, a, it's, like, it's like having two ingredients side by side and one's better than the other. And you're like, send it to the stupid people to use the other stuff, right? Keep the good stuff to us. So they send us the Arborio and they keep the Carnaroli for us. Villone Nano is in there too and Villone Nano is a very small production and you, it's hard to find Villone Nano. But Carnaroli and Arborio, the two rices, all right? Carnaroli is what the Italians use. 
Arborio is what the Italians want us to use. I don't fall for that. I've been to Italy. I've seen it happen. We use Carnaroli. It's more forgiving. It's easier to use. It makes better risotto. Risotto is supposed to be al dente and creamy. All right? That's the idea of risotto. So we use Carnaroli. Now in the pot here, we're basically stirring some risotto. There's a little butter in there. It's stirring up. The main thing with risotto is you always use hot liquid to put in there. You never put cold water in there, cold stock. I'm using water today because it's easier for everybody to eat. If I put chicken stock in here, it might alienate a vegetarian. If I put veal stock in here, people are like, oh my gosh, why are you using veal? So you can use whatever you want at home. You can use lobster stock and put lobster in coordinate. You can use chicken stock. You can use whatever you want. I'm using water today, and I'm gonna demonstrate to you how simple is best, all right? I'm very into simple cuisine, good flavors, good ingredients, proper seasoning, proper salt, all right? So, now, I don't really have a ladle. Is there a ladle in the kitchen? All right, so we're gonna get a ladle here, because the idea is, I'm a ratio cook. I like recipes, but ratios rock, right? So, pound cake. Pound cake's a pound of everything, and you can make a cake, right? Sugar, butter, whatever is in pound cake, right? Um, Spetzel, one, two, three ratio. One part eggs, two parts milk, three parts flour, right? Risotto, one part rice, three parts liquid. That's the old, that's the old universal risotto, risotto ratio, one to three. One part risotto rice, carnaroli, arborio, villano nano, and three parts of whatever liquid you want to put in. Chicken stock, veggie stock, lobster stock, shrimp stock, whatever you want to put in. All right. But you don't put it all in at the same time. It's a little bit of a little bit at a time. Is there a ladle? And then from the scoop? The plastic thing is fine. That's perfectly fine. Yep, that's perfectly fine. I forgot a ladle today. So my, so I packed the car up myself. All by myself, I packed up the car. I got everything here except for a table, a tablecloth, uh, a ladle. What else did I miss? That's about it. Okay, I did good for being... For usually relying upon her, I did really good today. Did really, I'm proud of myself. All right? So, anybody else feel that way? You're laughing. <laughs> I did really good. All right, so, and all of it was easily solved. I got the table, I got the tablecloth. We're trying to get a ladle right now. All right, so, a um, little bit, a little bit, a little bit. What operation does it bring a ladle? I didn't have a ladle here. <laughs> I didn't have a ladle. <laughs> well, we buy a huge stuff. A box of stuff there. There's no ladle. <laughs> We're going to use this to scoop, okay? So, all right. So, this is a four, four, quart, four quart pan. This is one quart of rice. It, that is gonna, it's almost going to take all that, all that liquid, okay? So, that's kind of how we know what's going on. So, all right, so we have onions. You could put onions, garlic, shallots. We've sweated with some butter. We're stirring, is this on high or medium high? Just... Medium high, medium high, okay. All right. So everybody got the gist of how risotto, we're doing risotto. We're gonna stir that. His arm's gonna fall off, he's gonna have to ice it. Um, and then we're gonna have this most amazing creamy rice that's finished with Reggiano cheese and a little butter. And we're going to drizzle a little risotto, uh, uh, balsamic on top of it with some Reggiano cheese. All right. Now that everybody's got that down, right? Okay, cool. Now let's talk about balsamic. Who has balsamic vinegar at their house? Most people have balsamic vinegar at their house. It's the most iconic Italian ingredient besides prosciutto and white truffles and buffalo mozzarella. So, balsamic vinegar, there's two types. Almost every single type of balsamic vinegar you buy in the store is made with super cheap red wine vinegar. This jug, it's a buck. This jug is a buck. 
This jug of balsamic is 15 bucks. This is mostly the majority of this, right? The main ingredient in this is this. You're getting ripped off, basically. This is a few hundred bucks. And we're gonna talk about why this is a few hundred bucks and that's 15 bucks. When you see the word balsamic glaze at a restaurant, I'm in the restaurant, I've been in the restaurant industry all my life. 18 years owning my own restaurant. It's tough to make ends meet in a lot of restaurants. A lot of restaurants will do whatever they can to make money, maximize profits, and do whatever they can. So when you see the word balsamic glaze, balsamic reduction, it's 15 bucks plus sugar reduced by half. That's your balsamic glaze right there. Balsamic glaze, balsamic reduction, balsamic sauce. That's it. This is 20 bucks a bottle. This is the real deal. Real deal balsamic from, from the producer that's naturally aged, naturally thickened, no sugar. Uh-oh, what's happening over there? All right, so the majority of balsamic vinegar is indeed white, I'm sorry, red, red wine vinegar. And then they put juice in it, grape juice from that region. But they take this grape juice and they reduce it down by half, three quarters, and so they have what's called must, M-U-S-T, grape must. They take grape must, they take red wine vinegar, they marry them together. The more reduced this gets, the sweeter this gets. The more palatable this gets. The more of this they put in here, the more palatable this gets. The more they reduce this, the more of this that they put in here, the more expensive this gets. It's a ratio of what's what in the vinegar, right? But you never really know because they don't put it on the labels. How are we doing up there? Just, just keep adding water as you need it. So it's a ratio of dollar vinegar, grape juice reduced, how far is it reduced, and how much is the consumer willing to pay? If you're a chef, you want to pay 15 bucks and buy the cheapest stuff. If you're a consumer, you might pay 20 bucks. You might pay 30 bucks. You might pay 60 bucks as a consumer. It depends upon what you're gonna do with it, right? For me, balsamic is sort of like a finishing ingredient. After you grill your lamb chops, after you grill your steak, you drizzle a little bit of this, this on your lettuce, a little bit of extra virgin olive oil, it's heaven. You drizzle a little bit of this on your figs, on your strawberries, on your prosciutto, on your risotto, it's heaven. This is no good on strawberries, trust me. It's no good on strawberries, no good on prosciutto. It's not, it's not really good on anything, honestly. So, but if you add sugar as a chef and reduce it, you, you, got, some, you got some lead way with it, right? Because you're doing what this, the juice is doing naturally by reducing. Now, all balsamic vinegar, um, all balsamic vinegar, no matter what the ratio is and how good it is, has to hit oak. It has to hit oak barrels. By law, in Italy, to put the balsamic logo on it, and be careful, because you can buy bal quote unquote balsamic from California, from Peru. That's not balsamic. It's make-believe balsamic. Some of it's good, by the way. But you have to know what's in it, right? You have to do a little investigation. But if it's from Italy, part of Italy, and it says balsamic, right? It's, it's got to hit oak. It's got to hit the oak barrels. The oak barrels are massive. Like one oak barrel is going to fill this whole area right here. I've been in them. If you go over my booth over there, I have a picture of the big balsamic vats and the small little barriques where they're aging stuff 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Massimo um, Toshi gave me a uh, tour back in 2018 of his balsamic production facility 
with one of the inspectors from the coalition, and it was amazing. I just saw Massimo this year in New York, and I haven't seen him since then because of COVID, and it was great to catch up with Massimo uh, Toshi. But, and Massimo makes both. He makes the really cheap stuff, and he makes the really high-end stuff. Because you know there's a market for both, right? So you just you, you do both when you're that when, when you're when you're making the stuff. So everyone understand so far. Most balsamic is made with cheap red wine vinegar. You put grape juice in it, you reduce it, and you start aging it in oak. Minimum of sixty days. But what if you were to say, you know what? I'm not going to put the cheap vinegar in. I don't want to put cheap red wine vinegar in my balsamic as a producer. What if I just take straight grape juice? Reduce it and age it. What if I did that? Pretty smart. It's called non-acidic balsamic. This is where you get the true balsamic, where it's rounded out. There's no, not much acid in it. And it's just grape juice. There's no fillers, no cutters. So I meant to bring a bottle. I didn't today. But they're those little tiny bottles that are like $100, $150 that have a little bottom shaped on it. I'll bring one tomorrow. It was on my desk today. I had two bottles on my desk and I thought I made it in my bin. Maybe it's in my booth over there. So there's two different certifications for balsamic. One for the vinegar based, which not all vinegar based is bad because if you have a producer that's saying, I'm gonna put lots of grape juice in, reduce it, little bit of, of, the, of the cheap vinegar, they're gonna make a nice vinegar. It's gonna be nice. But most of them are value conscious. The other side of the coin is no vinegar, all juice, reduced and fermented. That's where you get the $75, $100, dollars small bottles. Now that vinegar is so regulated by the Italians that the producer, if you're a producer of that, you have these small barrels. They literally, in small barrels like that, that's the size of the barrels. They hand it over to the consortium. They hand it over to the government. The government takes possession of it. They taste it along the way. The government packs it for you in bottles, the same bottles. It's, a, it, it's basically a copyrighted bottle. They pack it for you, make sure it meets the standards, and then ship it back to you and you put your label on it. Same thing with Reggiano, sort of the same thing with Reggiano cheese. With Reggiano cheese, the inspectors walk in on a regular basis. They prod it, they taste it. I've been in Reggiano fa uh, warehouses. I've actually been in a Reggiano Parmesan producer at eight o'clock in the morning when the milk's coming in. Reggiano has two milks. The night before, the milk comes in at eight o'clock at night. It sits there, it separates. They skim it and use the skim part. At six o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning, the milk comes in and it's milk that hasn't set time to separate yet. So they use whole milk and they mix the two and make Reggiano cheese in these copper vats. Jamie and I have been there with literally 12 copper vats in a room. The difference between Reggiano and, and Grana, Grana can use the copper vats all day long. Reggiano, by law, one batch a day in each pot. So we hung out there in the morning, and by 11 o'clock, they're like, we're done. I'm like, you guys worked a half day. What do you mean you're done? Like, we can't, we can't cook anything else in these vats right now. We're done for the day. It's one and done for Reggiano. Grana, however, we went to a Grana, they're all day long making in those copper vats, which is why Grana is so much cheaper than Reggiano. There's always a reason why price is an issue. There's always a reason why price is an issue. All right, let's check this out, this risotto. All right. Oh, look at that. Look at that. All right, so. The same thing happens in wine, folks. The same exact thing happens in wine. When you make wine at a very large scale and cut corners, you can make very inexpensive wine. Same thing happens with tequila. Do you know that most tequila, well, by law, tequila is allowed 1% by volume and additive. Any tequila fans here? Anybody drink tequila? So tequila, 99% tequila, they can add whatever they want for one, up to 1%. Glycerin, sugar, flavors, anything they want, they can put in the bottle. Free game. 
When you think you're tasting tequila, you're like, oh, this is nice. Yeah, because it's nice is what well, 1% they put, there's a flavoring. So there is now certified, certified additive-free tequila on the market. So if you're a purist and you want pure tequila, you can find it. You can also get mezcal and other things that are much purer than tequila. Because tequila was the chosen one. Tequila was the one that went industrial like cognac. And tequila is the one that got a lot of shortcuts. And tequila is the one that's just... I can talk to you about three hours on tequila. I love tequila. I love agave spirits. I love bourbon. I love, I love all that stuff. That's why I'm here. So, but there's always like a reason why wine is cheaper and more expensive. There's a reason why balsamic is a certain price and more expensive. Is a reason. There's a valid reason. Now, am I saying go out and buy the most expensive balsamic vinegar you can and use it for everything? No, because everything has its place, right? Everything has its place. But if you want to know the difference and be able to sprinkle a little bit of super high quality balsamic on your lamb chops or your lettuce or your mozzarella, then now, now, now you know the difference of the difference. So, and if you're like, hey, you know what? I'll buy a jug of this and throw in 10 cups of sugar and reduce it and call it a day, then you know, then you, then you know the difference. All right, so how's our risotto doing? How's your arm doing? Good, okay. <laughs> All right, so any questions so far about anything? Where can you buy carnaroli rice? Great question. I have a couple here today you can buy, they're six bucks. But besides that, you can buy them at a good, high quality Italian store that knows the difference. Um, I'm assuming, I don't know if Whole Foods or some type of store has it like that, but you can find it in a good store, a good Italian store, they will have. They're gonna tour, push you to Arborio because that's what they typically know. But when you talk to chefs, chefs are like, no, no. Good chefs are like, oh, Carnaroli, you don't use Arborio. So it's on Amazon. Of course, everything's on Amazon. Everything's on Amazon. How much? How much? 16 for two and a half pounds. This is, this is 2.2 pounds, six bucks. We sell these at the restaurant because, yeah. During COVID, my restaurant boomed because I said in the very, very beginning, I looked at the situation. I'm like, everybody still has to eat. And everybody's going to drink more because they're home. So my restaurant had its best year ever in 2020. 2021 was even better. And 2022 is right on mark with 2020, a little bit above. Because I said to myself, Everybody has to eat. In fact, I wrote a book called Everybody Has to Eat, and it's for restaurant owners on how they missed the mark on COVID. Because all you had to do was just try. Yeah, we busted our ass, we worked hard. I worked a lot of overtime. There was not staff there some of the times. But I said, I kept saying to myself, everybody still has to eat. Nobody stopped eating during COVID. And if you're a restaurant owner, and you had that in your mind, and you have put food out to people, they would do it. So we would do videos on how to cook risotto. And we'd sell cases of this kind of stuff in, in a week. We did wild salmon deals, frozen wild salmon deals. We'd sell 500 pounds of wild salmon in a week because people would go home and take the recipe we took and go home and cook wild salmon. So everybody still eats. So that's a whole different subject. That's for restaurant owners. That's not a totally different subject. All right, so, all right, let's take a look at the, the risotto. Oh, look at that. That's getting really nice. It's getting really, really nice. So, this, this, I'm making balsamic risotto today. In Italy, you do not make balsamic risotto with acid based, acid based balsamic. That is a big no no. If you make risotto, balsamic risotto in Modena, in Emilia Romagna, you use the non-acid based, you use the juice reduced and fermented. If you use the vinegar, imagine adding vinegar to risotto. It's no fun. It wouldn't be enjoyable. No matter how much butter and cheese you add to it, it's no fun. So that's the general rule in, uh, in, in Emilia Romagna. All right, any questions? For Who's hungry? 
I don't blame you. What, <laughs> what time is it? 3.40, okay, so I'm, I'm sort of on time. All right, so. Yes. Yes. Want to ask, want to ask what the question is? At a, where do you? Where do you get the right balsamic vinegar? You get the right balsamic vinegar. All right. So here's here's the cool part. Dinagaris. This producer right here, when you flip onto the back, will tell you how much juice is in here and how much vinegar is in here. They break it down. They're one of the only producers that breaks it down for you. Dinagaris. All right. That's a really. This is you can. This is a bigger producer, but for most people, they can walk into Whole Foods and find this. They can walk into an Italian specialty store and find this, right? So, Whole Foods specialty store. Dina Garris is really good because they have the breakdown in the back. And they tell you. What do those say? The back? Must versus, versus. Does it, say, it says on the back. It's small writing. They, they break it down, they break it down for you. They say the concentrate and they say the... 25% grape juice, 35% grape juice, 50% grape juice. This is 15% grape juice. 15% to give you like a, a, an idea and it's not reduced much. So you should never go to a store, you should go to a store that allows you to taste vinegar and olive oil, right? That's where you should go. Go to a store, there's lots of stores out there that allow you to taste now and explain to you what, you're, what the product is you're having. Super, super important. Never, ever, ever, ever buy olive oil from TJ Maxx, Marshalls, or Home Goods. You know when you're standing in line walking up? You see, oh, extra virgin olive oil, $7.99. It's almost expired. Olive oil has a two-year shelf life. It oxidizes. It turns rancid. It's not good for you. If olive oil was invented today, it would be one of the top 10 therapeutic things you can put into your body. Olives are fruit. They have polyphenols. It's fresh pressed juice. Fresh pressed juice of olives. Not two-year-old pressed juice of olives. Not 18-month-old. It's fresh pressed juice of olives. You want to get as fresh as you possibly can. All right? So from that point, when you go to Marshall's, it's the stuff that they couldn't sell at a store that Marshall's got the leftovers, and you look at it, it's like, oh, extra virgin olive oil, great. And it expires in six months. It's already almost two years old. Pay the extra money for high quality olive oil because it's literally one of those things where it's, it's almost, it's rancid. Rancid food is nothing. All right, let's see what we got here. Oh, that looks nice and creamy. Oh, all right. All right, so I have everybody can see, we're at the stage here where it's just nice and creamy. Wow, we're gonna turn this off. We're gonna add a little bit of butter in here. I don't cook with much butter, by the way. Like, I really do not like to cook with butter. I'm a, I'm a huge olive oil fan. However, risotto, I do not cook with butter. You come to my restaurant, not much has butter in it at all. I'm just not a butter fan. Because honestly, if a chef adds butter, sugar to something and cream, anything tastes good. You're like, oh wow, this is great. I'm like, dude, you put cream in that. You can put cream in, put cream in corn, cream in scallops, cream in shrimp. Of course it's good. But how about using like 
tomatoes and searing off the tomatoes and getting the tomato juice out of there and mixing it with some olive oil and some good salt and making the cream is a cop out, butter is a cop out. However, risotto needs, that's why I said in the beginning that I've done risotto without. I've used mashed uh, sweet potato puree for it. So, which is what I would rather use. And every risotto in my restaurant, every risotto in my restaurant, we don't, we use those butter, but we also use olive oil. Olive oil finishes every risotto. I don't have olive oil here today and it's not finishing this. This is a balsamic risotto I'm making, traditional what they make in Modena. But in my restaurant, every risotto has olive oil. A little butter, a little olive oil, half and half. So, oh, look at that, wow. Oh, boy. Wow, oh my gosh. Wow, who's hungry? <laughs> he worked up in heaven. Oh wow, look at that, look at that. Oh my gosh. Imagine searing off some scallops and putting some scallops in there or some lobster. Oh, oh boy. Some, some mushrooms, some morel mushrooms some porcini mushrooms. Folks, cooking is what you like. Cooking is what you want. Just because I make something doesn't mean you have to follow the recipe. Cooking is, is baking's a different story. Don't think, oh, I'm gonna skip this and skip that. And, but cooking like this is, is totally what you want. Don't ever get caught up in a recipe and be like, oh, I don't like pumpkin. Just add something else. Put, you can put pumpkin puree in here, right? You don't like pumpkin puree? Skip the pumpkin puree. Put sweet potato puree. Don't put any puree. Just put shrimp in there. Put lobster in there. Whatever you want. Totally whatever you want. You like smoked brisket? Put some smoked brisket on top of it. Whatever you want. Jake, can you come help serve? Thank you very much. Let's give a hand. <laughs> I'm here tomorrow too, I need another volunteer tomorrow. Anybody else? Who's here tomorrow? Anybody else here tomorrow? Now that I said I need a volunteer, nobody's like, no, not me. So we're gonna put on the glaze. We're gonna put on the, the acid up. All right, so we're gonna start serving some risotto um, in just a moment here. Any questions about anything? Any questions about food, about olive oil, about salmon? Any questions about real food? Anything about that? No clear bottles. Olive oil should not be in clear bottles. It should be in a tin, airtight. So you store olive oil at home, airtight, in the refrigerator, in the dark. Do not take a tin and stick your knife in the edge of it and crack a hole in it and sit there. In fact, who cooks with olive oil? Stop it right now. Stop it. Olive oil is no good to cook with. Olive oil oxidizes extremely quickly. First of all, the only olive oil you should buy is extra virgin, right? Do not buy pomace, it's toxic. They use hexane gas to extract it. It's not good. In Italy, they call it lampante, it's lamp oil, it's fuel oil. It's not fit for human consumption. They have to add extra virgin to it to balance it out. Do not cook with olive oil. In fact, most oils are not good to cook with, by the way, because once you extract an oil, it's refined. Once you put it on heat, it kills it. But certain oils do withstand better heat, much better heat, like coconut, macadamia, avocado, rice oil, Men, by the way, if you're consuming seed oil at home, it's not good for testosterone. Seed oil kills your testosterone. So men and wives take note of that. So that's seed oil now out, right? So oil's a tough thing to cook with. There's really no like shining star in the oil world of like, oh, this is, this is the savior of the oil. It's all oxidized at a certain point, but coconut, macadamia, avocado. We use, on a, on a scale that we cook with, 
We use rice oil, super expensive, but we use rice oil to saute with. I don't have a fryer in my restaurant, thank goodness, because it's just, fryer oil is a disaster. Can I start sending people up? Okay, so one at a time, people can start coming up or if we can form a line. We can start going here. Yes, first, exactly. Yes, 100%. It's modified. It's not extra virgin. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Tag me, please. Thank you. You're welcome. So, oil's a tough thing to cook with because it's just. Thank you. I can guarantee you that rancid oxidized oil is not good for your body. Rancid oxidized oil is not good for your body. As and the way they make oil in a commercial setting, like when a chef buys a jug of oil to cook with, it's automatically rancified, burnt, and then bleached. But oil does not have protein in it, so you'll never smell the rancidity. You'll smell the rancidity in oil once they fried chicken wings in it for four days. You'll be like, oh, that oil smells. It's not the oil, it's a chicken protein in the oil. All oil is rancid when you buy it. It's it's rancid, all commercial oil. Extra virgin olive oil is a different thing. Cold pressed coconut oil is a different thing. What about when they tell you to do a a oil and a little bit of butter t together? Oil and butter? Yeah. What oil are you doing? Like, well. What oil? It's, it's all oil's the same. Well, the oil's the same. It's, yeah. so, so butter's not bad to cook with, by the way, folks. Sure, absolutely. Make sure you tag me. Tag me on Instagram. One chef on a mission, tag a Roman time. So, butter's not that bad. I'm not a huge fan of cooking with butter, but butter's double bonded, it's saturated, it's not gonna break down as much in the pan. Some people are like, oh, butter, cholesterol, then avoid it, fine, right? Some people are like, I don't care about the butter, I'll do it, then do the butter. Yeah, that's what I cook with main butter. What's that? See, that's my main. Main yeah, butter, yeah, butter, yeah. lard. If you're on the butter and lard, stay with that. It's better than the seed oil. Far better than the seed oil. Absolutely. Thank you. you left me out. No, it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> All right. Thank you. You're welcome. I probably left myself out. I probably didn't make it up for myself. Any other questions? Should we talk about salmon for a moment? Wild salmon versus farm salmon? Who eats salmon here? Who eats salmon? Okay. It's too fishy. Farmed salmon is the most toxic food in the world. Farmed Salmon is the most toxic food in the world. I don't care if it's certified organic, certified sustainable, or the farm has the best thing on their website. They are lying to you. They're pieces of crap. They are lying to you. Farmed salmon is toxic. Do not eat farmed salmon. They're all a bunch of liars. The way the industry is set up, the open net farming is a disaster for our environment. It's a disaster for our health. It's a disaster for the salmon. This is every salmon in farm Every salmon region has a mortality rate. Scotland, which is said, oh, the best farm salmon comes from Scotland. 22% of salmon farms, 22% of salmon and salmon farms in Scotland die because they're toxic and dead. Would you drive by a farm with beef and see 22 cattle out of 100 dead on the farm and eat the beef? You wouldn't, but you can't see the fish in the bottom of the ocean. And all these farms lie to you. They bribe chefs, they pay chefs, and chefs walk into this and be like, I have organic salmon. It's a fraud. It is a fraud. And I'm furious with chefs that do this. Chefs that know better, I'm furious. It's a disaster. They're killing off the new reports in British Columbia. The new reports in British Columbia, they've killed the salmon farms there. They cut the salmon farm leases off. They're having record number of wild salmon in British Columbia. Because when you put a salmon farm in the migratory path, of wild salmon, the lice and disease go into the wild salmon, and the wild salmon do not have a chance to live. They die off. The Atlantic Ocean has been a disaster for Atlantic for wild salmon for four decades, five decades since the 60s. The more farms they put, the more it kills wild salmon. No matter how organic it is, there's no organic certification. Though don't let chefs lie to you, don't let restaurants lie to you, do not let fishmongers lie to you. It's a disaster. 
Look at the new reports from British Columbia where they yank the farms, salmon are replenished naturally. They're replenished because there's no lice and no diseases. Farmed salmon is the most toxic ingredient out there. It is a disaster, it's a scam. It's not good for you, it's not good for our health. Did I get that point across? Great, perfect, all right. That's, I love real food, I'm very passionate about this kind of stuff, and you wouldn't drive by a cattle farm and see 22 out of 100 cattle dead and eat the beef. You wouldn't. Faroe Islands, scam. Scotland, scam. British Columbia, scam. Nova Scotia, scam. Chile, scam. It's all farmed salmon. There's no right way to do the wrong thing. It's impossible. They have great marketing, phenomenal marketing, and they trick a lot of chefs. They're like, oh, I got some organic salmon, I got some sustainable salmon. I got better salmon than, than my neighbor has. It's all the same, it's in nets, it's filled with lice, they have a mortality rate no matter where they are. Lock Duhart, the most sustainable salmon in the world, go on YouTube, type in Lock Duhart. You'll see the locals there filming them dumping tons of dead salmon out of the, out of the pens from the most sustainable salmon farm in the world because they're in, <laughs> they're in, they're in, they're in a disease-ridden environment. They're toxic. They're dying. It's what happens. All right. Excellent. Thank you, everybody, very much. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank <laughs> you. Wow. I love it. Great, thank you. Thank you. Rice, yes. Trace? Yes, there you go. Thank you. Great. There's a couple more, there's a little more risotto up here. Where's the garbage at here? Is there garbage? Right there. Where's the garbage at? Oh, green, green garbage in the back, folks. Green garbage in the back. There's more risotto up front. Everybody, thank you very much. Thank you. Give it up for Chef Marcus. Can you the whole bag once we open it? No, you can use it whenever you want. Yep. Seal it so it stays fresh. 100%. Uh, put it in a Ziploc bag and a plastic container. It's not going to go bad. Put it in the refrigerator. It's not going to go bad. How much is it? Six dollars. I'll be back tomorrow. Thank you very much. Appreciate your help. Oh, my pleasure. Jamie, we'll see you soon. Yes, thank you. Thank you. She's right here. She's coming up. Everybody needs to have some wines. And she needs to put on her mind. So if you want to know a little bit about that. Of course, 100%. Awesome. We might at the booth. We might at the booth. We might at the booth. Our sponsor, winerack.com. Uh, without that, without anybody here, no. Uh,